when it's caught in that small pulmonary arterial and becomes wedged, just like the finger over the straw analogy, everything distal to that is the same thing, is the same pressure. So I can estimate this pressure by looking at the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So let me go back a half a step and, um, well, let me talk about Starling's Law first. This is just showing that as I increase the pressure, I increase the stroke volume and ultimately the cardiac output. There's a, um, it's not quite linear, um, but there is a, a dose response. As I go up on the preload, I go up on the stroke volume and ultimately the cardiac output. The way we measure this thing called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is by floating a catheter into the heart through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, through the right ventricle, and floating it into the pulmonary artery. When it's wedged, that pressure downstream is, is, is reflective of what the left atrial pressure is. So I can ultimately know how much preload I have on the left by looking at the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is what the catheter looks. You know what? Let me go grab one. Probably easier to see if you, if you can see one. So this catheter has, it's actually got four different channels, four different lumens that are built into it. But there's a small balloon near the tip, and this is where I'd be measuring pressure here. So under normal conditions, it's measuring pulmonary artery pressure. A little bit back from the balloon, there's a thermistor which measures temperature, and we'll find that that's... Uh, one method by which we can measure cardiac output directly. Okay. So here they are floating it into the right atrium, into the, through, the, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonic valve, and it's sitting in the pulmonary artery. When the balloon is inflated, then it wedges. And just like my straw, the pressure here is the same pressure as here during end diastole, just prior to contraction. All the same pressures equate, and that's called the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. If you ever had the opportunity to see one of these inserted, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting because you can see exactly where the catheter is at by watching the waveform that they have as the pressures change. Where do they put it in at? Usually a large vein, like subclavian artery. vein. I'm sorry? Like your artery or no? You can put it into the brachiocephalic, but usually they'll end up using the um, sub subclavian vein, internal, in, internal jugular vein, femoral vein. Really, any any veins, as long as you get back to the heart, they're all. Right. Let's face it, they all go back to the heart, mm -hmm. except, for the, except for the pulmonary vein, which is a whole separate issue. So look, let's see what, what what ends up happening. Here, I've got the catheter just placed into the right atrium. I don't know if you have these slides or not. Doesn't matter if you if you if if you don't. And as you can see in the tracing on the bottom, what I have is basically a low amount of pressure that is present. In fact, it's the lowest pressure 
in the vascular in the systemic vascular system. Normal value for CVP is two to six millimeters of mercury. So the normal preload for the right side of the heart is two to six. The physician continues to advance the catheter and, pa and passes it through the tricuspid valve and I now have a right ventricular pressure. And the right ventricular pressure has a systolic value and a diastolic value where when we looked at the CVP it was just one value. Am I good so far? Pass through that tricuspid valve and immediately the picture changes. It's actually quite neat. Now he's got the balloon inflated so that it follows the flow of, ga of, of the blood because it's got to make m almost a U-turn to head into the pulmonary artery. And once it goes into the pulmonary artery and that air and the the pulmonary semilunar semi valve closes, I now have, instead of 25 over 8, I'm sorry, 25 over 0 as we had here, I now have 25 over 8. So I have the establishment of a diastolic pressure by the closure of that pulmonary valve. Did we talk about how to calculate a mean blood pressure? How, what, what is it? And it's going to give us our mean pressure. All right. If I keep floating that catheter, eventually it's going to get wedged. And I now have that value that gives me an indication of the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which is an indication of the left ventricular end diastolic volume or preload on the left. CVP was 2 to 6. This one's 4 to 12. Just double it. Easy way to remember it. Ms. Roberts. Four to twelve. So as they're advancing the catheter, you can see we start off with our very low CVP pressure. As we pass into the right ventricle, we have a high a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure that's pretty close to zero. And then we go into the pulmonary artery, 25 over 8 and our wedge pressure somewhere between 4 and 12. This, I believe, is out of your book. Okay. Are we okay on preload? How much stretch that muscle has prior to contraction? That stretch is going to be determined by how much volume is inside and that volume is going to be reflected by a pressure. Right side is the CVP, left side pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Now that we're all back to where we were a week ago, then nobody paid attention to me, except for Jessica, who said I was playing mind games with her. Well, I, I, I don't think she used the word games. I could, I could, I could be wrong there. So how much is in that tank prior to contraction is one factor that's going to affect how much ultimately is pumped out. A second factor is how much work it has to pump against. What is it pump, what's downstream to that ventricle that it's got to push the blood against? So 
So during systole, as it's contracting, how easy or hard is that ventricle have to pump out? I said that terribly. Let me try that again. The amount of work that the ventricle has to do to push the blood out through the aorta or through the pulmonary artery. It, imagine taking a pair of pliers and clamping off the aorta. You now have increased afterload. You now have increased the work that ventricle has to pump against. What determines afterload is a couple of different things. First of all, just the viscosity and the volume of blood you have. If I have blood that's got, uh, that's very thick, very viscous, it's going to be very hard to pump. If I have blood that's a little more watery, it makes it easier to pump. And we'll talk about what would control that at some other point. Um, damage to the aortic valve is going to affect how easily or hard it can pump blood out. But the major component is something called vascular res re resistance. And this is determined What controls blood pressure? The arterioles. They're the ones that regulate how, how much m muscle contraction is, is present and how much blood flow is able to get through. That's what we're talking about, the vascular resistance. What's it got to push against? Okay, let me just stop for a moment as far as speaking English and speak a foreign, a foreign language here. Anybody ever take an electronics course? I thought not, but I thought I would ask. There is a law, and I don't know if Jeannie talked about when she talked about um, electrical safety. Good. Okay. But something called Ohm's Law. And Ohm's law talks about resi re resi Ohm's law talks about resistance. We've already learned that resistance is a change in pressure over the flow rate. Airway resistance, specifically. That same relationship between a pressure differential and flow, I want to find the man who designed this building and I want to shoot him. <laughs> who would put tile as a flooring? Really? That was back in the day where we didn't have carts, where we had real thin books and we had backpacks. All right, so resistance is a pressure drop over a flow rate. And it's true whether we're talking about airway resistance or we're talking about resistance that the blood has as it's being pumped. In the case of vascular resistance, it's a pressure from a high point to a low point. What's the highest pressure in that circuit? What's the lowest pressure? In the flow, is nothing more than the cardiac output. So let's talk about the pulmonary vascular system. Starting with the pulmonary artery, that's the highest pressure in the circuitry, right? Where does the pulmonary uh, vascular system end. Yeah, left atrial. Or 
we're going to use the surrogate, the wedge pressure. So if I can figure out what my mean pulmonary artery pressure is, and I can figure out what my wedge pressure is, and I know my cardiac output, change in pressure over flow, which in this case would be mean pulmonary artery pressure minus wedge pressure divided by cardiac output. I know, I now know my pulmonary vascular resistance. How much downstream resistance does the right ventricle have to pump against? How much squeeze of the pliers do I have on that pulmonary artery? What's it got to push against? Then we multiply this all by 80, because this is in millimeters of mercury, this is in liters per minute. It's got a weird combination of, of units there. I can do the exact same thing looking at systemic cir circulation. Highest pressure that you'll end up having is your mean arterial pressure. Which we know is systolic plus two diastolic divided by three. The lowest point in that circuitry is the CVP. And again, Change in pressure over flow times a factor of 80. You want to work, work through one? Let's say my blood pressure was 120 over 80, just to make numbers nice. Um, our CVP, let's say, is uh, 6, and my cardiac output is uh, 4 liters per minute. Figure out my mean, air, mean arterial pressure. Plus 160 over 3, 280 over 3, so 9, 7, 93. Sounds good. 93.3? Okay. So then it's 93.3 minus 6 divided by 4. 87.3 divided by 4. Oh, times, times 80. Sorry, that's what they had in there too. So 87.3 times 20, whatever that works out to be, 1,600 or something. Pardon me? 1,800? Ish. Ish. Where did the 4 come from? Cardiac output. No. I'm my measured cardiac output is four liters per minute. So I'm just gonna divide that. Oh, whole. that looks like a four. It looks like a four when you're looking at the L. Oh, the, the liters per minute. Four. Maybe if somebody could write for you know. No, they would all be given to you. The concept of afterload makes sense. Preload is how much I put in the tank to begin with. Afterload is how much it's got to pump against. They're both going to impact how much blood is, e is, e is ejected. Third one is called contractility. Contractility refers to how responsive that muscle fiber is. 
is the muscle fiber strong and hardy or is it flabby and weak? <clears throat> is my rubber band wimpy or strong? Okay, it's going to impact. So for a given amount of stretch, something that's got a high contractility is going to generate a bigger stroke volume than something that's got poor contractility. We call this inotropic. It's a fancy word for meaning how much oomph you have. If I have a high inotropicity, I have more oomph, I have a bigger amount of contraction for a given preload. Go ahead. You got a question, Jason? It, it is compliance. It is, you are 100% correct. It is a pressure volume relationship that is basically looking at how stiffer or limber they are. Why can't they? Because cardiologists and pulmonologists don't talk to each other. Got it. But it is that. If you have a reduction in compliance of the left ventricle, I have a stiffening of the left ventricle, it's not going to be as effective. There are drugs that we can give that have a positive inotropic effect. I increase the force of contraction, I increase the stroke volume, I increase the cardiac output, I increase the blood pressure. And there's some drugs that have a negative inotropic effect. Has anyone ever heard of the drug digoxin? It's a very common medication we give to improve force of contraction, especially in patients who are older and have a weaker heart. Yeah. Yeah, one of the side effects you're going to have is you end up having um, some alterations of the EKG strip. Yeah, so you are, you are correct. We can also have contractility being changed by electrolytes. So somebody who has perhaps, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a reduced potassium level, hypokalemia, they'll end up having some alterations in their ability to to generate a good cardiac output because it affects the, the um, muscle contraction. The biggest one, though, is this one. When I have, well, hopefully I don't, but patients who, do, who have a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, infarction implying death of tissue, if I have, say, my anterior wall now damaged, that means that that muscle cannot contract. If that muscle can't contract, I can't generate stroke volume simply because it's lost contractility. It would have a negative inotropic, right? There, the inotropic. The inotropic effect of the left ventricle is reduced. Right, so I just think so positive is you have a lot of peace. Negative, you, you don't have enough. That's correct. So that would be hypertrophic, right? Wouldn't you have hypertrophic? Isn't that like the same? No. No. So when you have a lot of peace, does that mean your force of contraction, does that mean it's, it's a stronger? It's stronger. Not, no, no. Stiff would be bad. Okay. Yeah. We don't want stiff. Because stiff. stiff implies that it doesn't move much. Okay. And we want a muscle that's going to contract okay. easily. Okay. Preload, afterload, contractility. And kind of like we, we're looking at um, compliance of the lung, same idea here. As we improve contractility, we get more cardiac output 
for a given amount of uh, preload. Let me just touch on a couple other things. First of all, this concept of heart failure. Um, and we can really talk about each ventricle itself failing. Um, to be honest with you, when one fails, the other one is right behind it. So it's really which goes first, the right or the left. Right heart failure, we're going to encounter quite frequently. Patients who have, who have uh, pulmonary disease frequently will end up having right heart failure, especially as we get towards the end of the course of life. Okay. Yeah, what was that? Here's my heart, right? My finely drawn heart. my pulmonary artery. One of the major causes of an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, an increase in right ventricular afterload, oh God, is this. Very potent vasoconstrictor. The body's response to hypoxemia is to clamp down the pulmonary vasculature. Why? Yes, Rick, why? It just does. Okay. So somebody who is chronically hypoxemic will have an elevation in pulmonary arterial pressure will have pulmonary hypertension. That increase in resistance means that that right ventricle has got to work harder. Does that make sense? It's got a lot of downstream resistance to pump against. So what ends up happening is the right ventricle actually becomes larger in size. Right ventricular hypertrophy a thickening of the right ventricular muscle. Because blood can't be pumped out of the right ventricle, or it's reduced in the amount that is, it backs up. Where does it back up? Backs up into the right atrium. Backs up into the inferior and superior, superior vena cava. Backs up into the periphery. This is where we end up getting jugular venous distension, hepatomegaly, um, ascites, swollen ankles, pitting edema. Am I, do those words make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So blood backs up on the right side. Okay. Primary cause of right heart failure is hypoxemia. So we do everything we can to fix that. There's a specific name we give it when it's associated with lung disease of some kind. It's called cor pulmonal or pulmonale. Cor pulmonal. I like that better. And it's just right heart failure secondary to lung disease. And you'll see it um, frequently with patients with COPD or kids with cystic fibrosis or something along that line. Because of the chronic hypoxemia, they end up with right heart failure. Left heart failure. Yes? Okay. No. That would not exist. Or does not exist as a matter of course. PO2 and saturation, saturation uh, there's a relationship with them that we'll talk about next module. Uh huh. Okay. That's, that, that would be an appropriate relationship. Yes. 
but 84 isn't, isn't hypoxemia. Normal. It's normal. You'll we'll find that as that PO2 falls, the saturation falls with it, but it's not a linear relationship. And I don't want to talk any more about that. So there. Left-sided failure, far more common. Okay, this is what we call congestive heart failure, DHF. I'm trying to think back, I think CHF is probably one of the top three reasons that people get admitted to the hospital. Readmission. Pardon me? Isn't it readmission? Or, or readmission, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're frequent flyers. Just like our COPD patients are, CHF patients are also. This is the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart becomes ineffective in pumping blood out to the s systemic cir circulation. And the reason for it is that there's just too much fluid on board. There's too much volume of fluid. And where, what it then does is because it can't pump out the left ventricle, where does it go? It backs up into the lungs, backs up into the left atrium, backs up into the pulmonary veins, backs up into the lungs. And what actually ends up happening is that the fluid eventually moves out of the vascular space and moves into the alveoli and floods them, what we call pulmonary edema. Okay. Distinction between the two okay? All right, we already talked about an arterial line. We talked about a central venous catheter. We talked about a pulmonary artery catheter. Um, obviously, the arterial line's into a systemic artery. The, the other two are into any large vein we can find. You saw the size of the catheter. It's got to be a pretty decent sized vein for it to pass through. And again, where this would ultimately lie, if we're going through the subclavian vein, going through the internal jugular, it's going to eventually end up in that right atrium area. Um, if blood pressure is too low systemically, call that hypotension, and obviously that's going to have a problem delivering blood to the tissues. High blood pressure is just as bad as low. Because with a high blood pressure, you've got a lot of resistance the heart's got to pump against, you're going to weaken and strain that heart. So this is why we strive to keep somebody's blood pressure in a normal range. And by the way, if anybody needs to have their blood... Um, Needs practice taking a blood pressure. I'm your man. I got a very nice bounding pulse. Easy to find. All right, so let's talk about some of these values that we end up measuring. Pulmonary artery pressure, we said was 25 over 8. And yes, I do want you to know these normal values. With the mean pressure, if you would calculate that out, somewhere between 10 and 20. If that catheter becomes wedged, I now have an indication of what the left side's preload is. That's 4 to 12. Once the blood exits, the left ventricle pumps through the aorta. I have a blood pressure, normal value 120 over 80, with a mean value of somewhere between 80 and 100. Passes through the systemic capillary system, comes back to the right side of the heart for our CVP of 2 to 6. And those are all in millimeters of mercury, obviously. What the heck is a BTFDC? You don't need to know this, but balloon tipped flow directed catheter. Yeah, right, whatever. 
but it's basically the mechanism by which we measure pulmonary artery pressure. Okay, so those are ones that you need to oh need to know. I believe I have this for you in your uh, in your notes. Um, the ones I gave you are the ones you need to know. We don't need to memorize all these, but well, if you notice, there is a a pressure drop as I go from my left ventricle to my right, atri right atrium and then from my pulmonary artery back to my left atrium. There's got to be a pressure differential, otherwise the blood wouldn't flow. Vaguely ring a bell someplace? But you should know, you give it the ones that you should know. These two, this one, this one, well, with it with its mean value. And this one. Those four that we drew here. The way blood that isn't that the way blood 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 flows? If you got blood going backwards, we got a problem. That means that we got a pressure problem someplace. Okay, let me take a five minute break here. Go ahead and start back. How cloudy is this? Pretty cloudy still? Just a couple uh, more terms, um, or a couple of other concepts that are there. We know that heart rate times stroke volume gives us cardiac output. Cardiac output then is going to impact blood pressure. And we know that this is determined by preload, afterload, and contractility. If I increase <coughs> the amount of blood that's in the system, in theory I should increase the stroke volume increase the cardiac output, increase the blood pressure. That's a BP. Hypervolemia means there's a larger m amount of volume of blood present in the, in the vascular system. Hypovolemia means that I've lost blood, <coughs> lost circulating volume. So if I take Sherry and I cut off her arm, she bleeds all over the floor, she will become hypovolemic. Volume. Volume of blood. Volemia. The body is going to respond to this fact that I have a reduction in preload because I cut off her arm by trying to increase blood pressure back by vasoconstricting. Her body senses, her peripheral, I'm sorry, her barrel receptors in the aortic arch and um, common car the carotid artery are going to sense a reduction in blood volume, a reduction in blood pressure, and say, ho, oh, hey, we got to get blood pressure back up. Well, what can it do? It constricts those arterial arteries vessels peripherally, trying to compensate and get blood pressure back up again. Somebody who is in 
I'll use the term, shock, due to a trauma like that, they're not going to have blood flow going to their periphery. Their great toe is not going to be well perfused. Sorry. I'm more interested in getting blood flow to my heart and my brain. That's kind of what the body does. Shuts down blood flow to the gut, shuts down blood flow to the kidney, shuts down all peripheral blood flow. So if you were to feel them, they would feel very cold. Why? Because the blood's not going there. It's a compensatory mechanism. Okay. Let's see if we can make some sense of this. What happens if I have a reduction in preload? As we just said, we end up having an increase in afterload to try and compensate for it. The body will also try and increase contractility. For whatever amount of work the heart is doing, could we give a little bit more? Because I got a problem, I don't got the preload. Notice it's using the other two to try and compensate. How do I fix this? other than sewing her arm back on. You increase preload with fluids. With blood. Something. Refill that tank back up again. And I monitor my preload CVP, wedge pressure, to make sure I don't overdo it. I want just enough. I want my CVP in the 2 to 6 millimeter mercury range, or my wedge in the 4 to 12 millimeter mercury range. Somebody loses their ability to control their vascular pressure. See this with some types of, of uh, severe head trauma where the connection between the brain and the periphery is, is impaired. It's called neuro neurogenic shock. Um, so spinal cord injuries. They don't, the, the control of blood pressure goes away. What does the body try, try, try to do? Make a guess. What's it going to do to preload? It's going to try to increase it. How, does, how is it going to try to increase it? Can the body regulate blood volume some way? Well, it can't. It can't vasoconstrict because it doesn't have the ability to control it. Yeah. yeah, it reduces urine output. It's one of the functions of the, of the kidney, right, to regulate blood volume. And it will also try to increase contractility. Okay. Are there drugs that we can use to increase vasoconstriction? That's vasoconstriction. I just ran out of room. Are there blood... Drugs that will cause, yeah, sure there are, okay? There are vasoconstrictors, a drug like epinephrine, adrenaline, it's one of its functions, okay? What about if I have too high of an afterload? What would we call that? Somebody's got a high blood pressure? Hypertension. If I measure my blood pressure and I find out it's uh, 210 over 120, I won't be that way very long before I stroke out, right? How do I get the blood pressure down? We vasodilate.
give a drug to reduce the effect of the arterial R constriction. Any of your antihypertensive agents try to accomplish this. And there are multiple ones we'll talk about. You can do it by, no, I won't go there. There's multiple ways that we can control blood, that we try to reduce the blood pressure. One of which is to decrease the preload through something called a diuretic. Promote urine output, reduce the preload, reduce the blood pressure. Contractility, whatever that is. body's going to try to control the other two. I have a left heart that's weakened because of a myocardial infarction. We actually try to increase preload. Whatever stretch we can get out of it, let's, let's, let's get out of it. Because I know that it's not pumping really hard. But let's maximize preload. Well, that was pretty stupid. How about afterload? going to also try to vasoconstrict and increase whatever it can pump, which is kind of stupid when you think about it. If I have a ventricle that can't pump really hard and I'm clamping down, that's actually going to make matters worse, but that's the way the body compensates for it. Yes? So if one of them is up, the other two would be down and vice versa? Is it always that way? kind of looks that way. This middle column is basically the way the body tries to compensate. This is what we can do. Okay. We'll come back and visit this as we get more into um, uh, some of the pathology, especially when we talk about myo myocardial infarctions next semester. My, this is my poor attempt to try and piece these together. Yeah. What are some things we could do? Oh, thank you. Let's see, inotropic agents. This is where we can give drugs like that DIG. We can give drugs like something, uh, something called dopamine, dobutamine. Bah, you're not there yet. should be familiar with this, how to calculate mean blood pressure. If we didn't have it on the last test, we'll have it on this test for sure. One last concept, I promise. Do you guys think that um, Ashley and Najee's cardiac outputs are the same? Why? They're different size, different genders, different ages. So what we can do, even though they may have different cardiac outputs, I can standardize them by looking at their height and their weight, saying how much body surface are we talking about? And we call that indexing them. And what we use is what's called a Dubois nomogram very fancy name. And I go ahead and I look at somebody's height. I look at somebody's weight. I draw a line between the two. So let me just see if I can do this here. I'm right around six foot. And on a good day I weigh, now let's say 180. Okay, I'm lying, 190. I then just simply draw a line between, the, come on you. Draw a line between the two and wherever they cross, that's my body surface area. This is measured in square meters. 
surface area in, in square meters. So if I measured my cardiac output as six liters per minute, and I knew my BSA, let's say, was two, my cardiac index then is that six divided by two or three liters per minute per meter squared. All I did is I just normalized it, taking the fact that somebody's really tall or really short out of the picture. So the little 90-year-old, 90-pound woman, I can standardize that and say, boy, her cardiac output is low, but you know what? She doesn't have a lot of body to circulate it around to, so her cardiac index is within the normal range. And we can do this to really any of the values that we measure, where cardiac output is, is a component of it. We can do it to the stroke volume. We can do it to the, any of the vascular resistances. What I would anticipate for a test question is I would give you this. I could ask you what the body surface area is for a person who's this tall and this weighs this much. I could ask you to calculate a cardiac index given the cardiac output is this and the person's 5'10 and weighs 140. What's the cardiac index? So you would have to figure out the BSA and then apply it. Something along that line. Okay. Just a way to standardize values. I love that one. Okay, let me stop there.